Welcome to another episode of Talking About Records. My name is G.I. Sanders from NTX Vinyl, a small chain of independent record shops in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. If you don't already subscribe or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, please do. Really appreciate it. Today's topic is one I'm really, uh, really passionate to talk about, and that is how I started a vinyl reissue record label. So I thought about the ways that I could kind of educate people about how I did this, or I should say we did this, we did this because I'm not alone. Um, but I figured instead of doing like step one, step two, which honestly we didn't plan it out that much. So um, we learned a lot along the way and I figured the best way to uh, convey what we've done and how we've done is just to tell our story. So a little bit of context is that I started NTX Vinyl as a record business about two and a half years ago. And if I think back, there's been three things that have overarching been the most beneficial um, from starting NTX Vinyl. One has been the number of people that I have met um, who are now, many of which, great friends uh, locally but also online. So there's just an incredible community of people that I've been able to engage with and become friends with. That's phenomenal. The other huge thing that I would not have anticipated going in is just being a conduit to great music because people tell me all the time like, man, thanks so much for finding this album for me, or thanks so much, I'm glad I found this in your shop. So just uh, being um, being that middleman that is someone who's shepherding music along to people, that's really cool and something I never would have expected. The third thing that's come out of NTX Vinyl, which completely unexpected, was the DFW Legacy Series. And that is my reissue record label where we have put out over the past past year, year and a half, we've put out eight or 10 records. We have some on pre-order as well. So we've essentially announced like 10 albums in the last 18 months that we've uh, either that have already been pressed and are in circulation, or maybe they've sold out or they're on pre-order, right? So the DFW Legacy Series came about in such an organic fashion um, that again, I can't really document step one through step 10 of how you should do it. All I can do is kind of tell you how we did it and maybe you'll, maybe there'll be some learnings in there, right? So the first thing I would say, uh, as far as how I started the label, well, again, not just me. It goes back to that first thing I mentioned and, and the people I've been able to connect with. So if you're thinking about starting a record label in any form or fashion, regardless if it's tiny or you've got grand aspirations, uh, don't try and do it alone. There are too many moving pieces. There are too many things to consider. There are too many uh, areas of expertise that you need to um, be educated in. So I would highly recommend finding some partners, finding some friends, some people to tackle this um, with you. That's exactly what I did. Again, it happened organically, but I was able to meet a couple of guys who I've known going back many years. But again, if I wouldn't have uh, started NTX Vinyl, probably would have never reconnected with them. So my partners, Travis and Jared and Ben, they are as involved in this in the DFW Legacy Series as I am. And the way it all got started was a very simple meeting where we got together and said, man, it sure would be cool if those albums that we all have on CD or had on CD uh, from way back in the day of our local scene, it would be great to have those on vinyl. They've never been pressed on vinyl. How do we do it? That was it. We said, man, we want these in our collection. Let's figure out a way to make it happen. It was literally the conversation we had. And we picked out an artist um, that Travis, my, one of our partners, um, actually managed. So this artist managed, uh, this, this artist Miser, uh, this album came out in the, the early mid 2000s and it was never on vinyl before. And that was our mission. Let's just see if we can get this on vinyl. Let's see what it takes to press it. We had never pressed records to vinyl. We'd never, um, you know, started a record label per se, but I will say this, we've all, myself included, have, ex have extensive experience in the music industry. And that's a very important part of this. So, uh, we, we're not coming at it blind, right? We've been on the management side. We've been on the artist side. We've been on, to some extent, the label side. Uh, we've been dealing with design and promotion and merchandising, all of those things. So the team, at the DFW Legacy Series, myself included, has a lot of expertise going into this. Without all that expertise, I don't know if we ever would have even attempted it because it probably just would have been way too difficult. But I can tell you when you're gonna start or if you're thinking about starting a record label, the first thing you gotta consider is like, who owns this music, right? It's on this record right now. But first of all, you've gotta consider, you know, who owns the rights to it? Where are the copyrights held? 
can I legally even go into a situation to press this record, right? Now, that's talking about a reissue. This is an album that was recorded many years ago, as all of the albums we've uh, reissued. And again, that's because they were already out on CD or maybe out on streaming. Um, so for our purposes, it was about going back to the original artist or label and figuring out who owned those masters. Now, if you want to start a record label and you want to deal with recording contracts and a new artist and producing new music, there's even more involved on that, right? Uh, because then you got to deal with, you know, what does that agreement look like? What is the label going to be responsible for versus what, are the, what is the artist going to do? What's the label going to pay for, right? So we didn't have to go down that path necessarily because, again, we're talking about music that's already been recorded and released. So we're going to we're talking about a reissue label, which is what the DFW Legacy series is. But still, you have to address the copyright issue. Who owns the music and is it even possible to go into a situation and get these pressed, whether you're pressing 100 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. You have to figure that out. So that's the first thing to consider if you're thinking about putting out a record that's never been on vinyl or if you're working with a new artist is like who owns the rights to the music, right? Um, and again, there's an expertise level because within our group, we've gone down that path before. And so we know what that looks like. We know the legalities of it. Um, and, you know, we kept it simple. We have a short little licensing contract, essentially, that we work with with our artists. I think it's like two, three pages long that essentially says, hey, if you sign here, you're giving us, the DFW Legacy Series, the rights legally to take your work, your recorded works, and go press them to vinyl. And then in the end, we'll split the money with you if there's any profit or we'll donate it to charity, whatever the agreement may be. We've gone both routes on those. Um, but I will say this. For us, um, the number one goal was not, hey, let's go make a bunch of money. Like, we knew better than that. We knew the reality of that. Like, I think down the road, hey, that would be great if there was a way to monetize what we're doing. But for us, all about the music. We literally sat there and said, we just want to add these records to our collection. How do we do it? And we knew there were other fans just like us, probably not thousands, but maybe hundreds of people who are fans of these bands from back in our local scene, which is where this all, all kind of came from. So for us, the number one goal was just, let's just get this thing out into the world. Let's let it um, you know, be rediscovered by people. Let old fans have a new um, you know, memento to add to their collection or frame on their wall, whatever it may be. So that was the number one goal for us. And you know, as we started down the path of accomplishing in that, um, it's working with the artist to figure out who owns the copyright. It's figuring out, okay, this album you know, was, was put out you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Where's the artwork? How do, we, um, you know, how do we figure out where the artwork is? How do we figure out where the masters are if we're actually going to go back and, and if they're even accessible, right? So in some of our releases, we've gone back and we've actually found, uh, you know, gotten access to the original master tapes, whether those were analog or digital either way. The, the best source we could find. In other cases, those masters literally do not exist because it's been 20 years. And so we did have to press digitally from the CD. Not something we prefer to do, but it actually can work, believe it or not. If the album is recorded professionally to begin with, you can do a lot with remastering these days. And so you've got ownership uh, and the rights to the music to consider. You've got the actual master tapes and locating them and figuring out if they're, um, um, you know, in a in a in condition to actually work with. Um, you've got again the artwork, so you got to figure like, hey, where do the original files exist from the CD that was pressed? Do we have to actually recreate them? Can we scan in the artwork and fix it up enough, clean it up enough with modern technology um, that will allow it to be expanded to look good? They're all different. Every single, the rele every single one of the releases we've done has been different in regards to that audio, in regards to that art. And there's a lot of the work, there's a lot of work involved there. So we have got a partner who works with us on the remastering, um, another local uh, guy who we've known in the scene for years, um, Derek Taylor, and he has gone back and remastered all, nearly all of our releases for vinyl, which has been incredible. Even the ones that have been sourced from CD audio, remastering it for vinyl is essential. Don't think you can just rip the CD, uh, CD audio and send it right to the pressing plant because if you do that, you're probably not going to be very happy with the outcome. And again, we learned that along the way. Our first release, second release, like we got test pressings and we had to send them back and get more test pressings as we got that dialed in and 
the further along we've gotten, the mastering has got easier, gotten easier. So, um, so again, you've got to have an audio engineer to do the mastering. You can't do this stuff yourself unless you consider yourself to be one, right? And so we've got this little web of partners, our, you know, our core team and then the other partners we've worked with who have create, started to create a little bit of a, a process for each of these. So now we, we have a project plan to where when we think of a release that we want to do, or we've got people come to us and say, have you ever thought about doing this? We'll take that into consideration and then we'll map it out based on, hey, here's how many releases we want to do you know, for the next year. And at least it's a, you know, a broad game plan. We don't always end up doing all of them because certain, certain ones just don't work out. Either there's not the demand for them that we thought or maybe the audio files just don't exist and we don't want to necessarily press from you know, subpar audio. Um, we haven't had, we've, we've, we've had pretty good luck with artwork even when having to scan in the CD and fix it up. Um, so there, there's, there's workarounds for roadblocks, but not, sometimes you just can't get around them, right? And so for us, it's been this journey of like, hey, let's figure out, um, you know, what albums that we would like to add to our collection. That's been first and foremost. Two, of those albums, do we think there's enough people out there? Do we think there's enough demand out there for this particular band, this particular artist that, again, has been gone for, let's say, 15, 20 years? Do they still have a fan base out there that is active enough that we can find? That's a big part of this because we don't want to press even 100 records or 200 records and then you know only, only be able to, to get 20 or 30 or 50 of them out there then we're just sitting on all these albums for years and that's no fun for anybody. And then it's just a loss, you know? Our goal has been to break even on the sales portion of it. If there's money to be made, that's great. The majority of ours have been break, break even projects, which is fine for us for what we're doing. Again, we've donated a lot of money to charity, which has been amazing. Um, and so you just kind of have to think through what is the goal if you're thinking about doing this. Is it to make money? Is it to just you know uh, preserve the music? There's a lot of different elements to come into this because there's a lot of work involved. If you're going to put all your time and effort and your money in, and in hopes to get it back, um, you gotta you gotta really want it, you know. And for us, we're so passionate about these these albums that came out during this period of you know kind of the the early '90s to the early 2000s. That's primarily what we've been been focused on. Um, for us, there's just so much passion there that we're willing to put in the time. That's really that's really what it comes down to, you know. Uh, thankfully, we've got a lot of industry experience on all sides, like I mentioned, that have made the uh, the effort not near as um, near as difficult as it would have been if we were coming at this blindly. But the fact that we have an idea of you know how to get the licensing take care of, how to get the the deal with the audio and get the best source possible. Uh, that we've got design shops in-house so we can um, reimagine the artwork best way possible. Um, and then it comes down to promotion. Like I mentioned, is there demand for it? So has the band, in this case, kept up with any social media presence, right? That's a big thing because if they haven't, then you're starting from ground zero and how do you find these fans, right? So you've got an album that came out 20 years ago and you want to put it out on vinyl? Okay, great, who's going to buy it? You know, How are you going to find the couple hundred fans that probably would buy it, but you've got to actually locate them somehow. If there's no presence on social media on a you know a band Facebook page or group or an Instagram page or whatever because the band's just kind of disappeared. It's going to be really difficult, you know, and it's going to be really difficult to even get to that break-even point. In short, you pretty much have to sell you know 120, 150 of a single LP to break even, right? If it's a double LP, you got to sell even a few more of that just to break even if you're only pressing a small amount. And so you do that math and you say, hey, do we think there's enough demand out here for this particular album that we think we can even break even on it? And in most cases, if the answer is yes, then we've done it if we love that album. And that's really the, the, the reality of it, right? And so we've worked with a couple different pressing plants, one here locally, which is amazing, hand-drawn records, uh, hand-drawn pressing and, and record label as well. Um, so we've worked with them a number of times. We've also worked with a plant out of Canada. We've worked uh, with a plant, uh, some plants in Europe. So we've done some experimentation. And what's come out of it is a catalog of records, which we're really, really proud of. So this is that first release by Miser. We did this on a, a kind of a purple and a blue swirl, which was really cool. That was our first one. We did a record uh, called Lifter by a band called Edgewater. Again, these are all bands coming out of the local scene in Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, Slow Roosevelt, Weightless. This is a really cool one on kind of a translucent blue. 
Uh, the Nixons, this is another thing we did. You can see this is signed. So we've done versions where the artist actually signs a certain number of copies, which is a really cool thing to do because obviously that drives demand from the, the fans. Here's uh, Welcoming Only Astronauts by Flickerstick. This was uh, probably the biggest release we did because they've got a really, uh, really um, kind of active fan base still this many years later. Here's an album uh, that I'm very familiar with because I played on it. This is the band I was in, South FM. So you get the idea. We've gone through and basically cherry-picked albums that either were very personal to us or we just really loved the music or we had strong relationships still with people who were in the bands or in the labels who put these out. And so a lot of it for us was built around the relationships we've had all these years, the community and the local music scene, which has just been amazing to kind of reconnect with so many people. Um, and so that's kind of the story of, of what we've done. We've, 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 we've kind of reinvigorated fan bases for several of these artists. Uh, we've... Uh, in some cases, got the band back in the same room, even if virtually, um, for the first time in many, many years to talk about the original recording and releases. And that's created a lot of interest um, around the uh, the reissue announcement when we've done this. And we typically put them up for pre-order. And then like everyone these days, it takes a long time to produce a vinyl record. So then you wait, you know, six, four, six, eight months um, get it back and then you got the okay what do we do now well, you got to ship them out to people well this is all fulfilled through ntx vinyl which is another big piece of this from an e-commerce perspective so we have a place to sell them which is on the ntx vinyl site um so people can purchase them there they can also pick them up in my local shops and then we've started to also distribute them to other local shops in the dallas fort worth area again because these are all local bands so this would all be different if we were working with bands who were known on a national level or international level, it would all be different if we were working uh, with new music and, and recording contracts versus uh, music that's already been, uh, you know, uh, recorded and released. So again, it's a the DFW Legacy series is a very, I think, unique, unique, um, you know, situation. But I don't think it's not repeatable. I'm sure there's great music scenes uh, with. Uh, in, in all the major markets and even some smaller markets where there are albums that uh, have never seen the light of day on vinyl and have been out of print on CD for 20 years and aren't even on streaming, you know? And so I think it would be an amazing thing if there would be people who'd follow in these footsteps and do this in other local cities. Um, whether or not that happens, I don't know. But uh, it, it is something that when we dove in, we had no real expectations for how long it would last. Honestly, still don't. We'll keep doing it as long as people are still interested and as long as we still have the energy for it, which I hope and I suspect will be a long time just because there's so many more albums to get to. Um, but I would say in the end, the it, it's been highly enjoyable despite the amount of work that is involved. And mainly that's because we get messages and emails all the time from people who just say, thank you so much for doing this. Because in a big way, the music has you know, again, thinking about these albums, the music's kind of died. It's not available anymore. It's certainly never been available on vinyl. Like I mentioned, it's certainly, uh, you know, the CDs have been out of print forever and lots of it's not even available on streaming. So for us and for me personally, being a huge vinyl enthusiast, just the fact that we're kind of preserving it and bringing this physical format back to life for these particular albums um, has just been incredibly gratifying and, and satisfying um you know the and and to be able to do it with some really good people across the board not only people involved in the label but also the whole community who kind of supported and bought a lot of these releases has just been an amazing thing and so uh, i'm just really grateful that that uh we're still doing it again i don't know how long it's going to last but um yeah so that's kind of our story that's the story of the dfw legacy series and how it's kind of happened um, i hope that we have a lot more releases uh, down the road. I hope we can sustain this for years. I don't know if that'll happen, um, but I'm really hopeful. And, and I think there's definitely enough albums um, from this period, even just locally, that um, that are great and that deserve to have another life on vinyl. I mean, for every for every artist in a local scene that gets signed and goes on to national success, and we had some of those. We had uh, Toadies and Tripping Daisy, uh, Drowning Pool. We had artists in the Dallas Fort Worth uh, Metroplex, who really broke out of the scene and had national and international success. For every one of those, there's another 30 bands right behind that that are just as good, just as good. They just never got their big break for whatever reason. 
And so there are these albums that I showed and ones we're working on now and ones that are available for pre-order, they're just as good as albums by those bands, which I love as well. They just never got the big break nationally, right? And that happens. That happens in every scene. So in Chicago and New York and LA and, you know, name any, again, major or even semi-major market, there are tons of artists that are only known in those markets to people who really were down and deep and involved in that scene. And for us, that's that's really kind of the gold mine is like, man, only the tip of the iceberg has ever been released on vinyl. So we have a lot to dig into as far as catalog is concerned, which is really exciting again versus uh, a, a record label who's working with uh, new artists and, and new recordings, which is, just creates a whole different set of problems and is, is completely valid and exciting. It's just not what we do for us. We're, we're all, we are um, indebted to the nostalgia of the Dallas Fort Worth music scene and everything that it contains. And, uh, and I got to tell you, we're not alone. There's a lot of people, um, a lot of people who are right there with us. And we've got a Facebook group that we formed that has been incredible and kind of been a, um, a home base for this community and has really helped it flourish and gives us great ideas and tells us what uh, albums we should be considering and yells at us all the time because we haven't pressed X, Y, or Z. And, and then we always tell them, hey, we can't do it. We don't have the rights to it. You know, there's a lot of things to consider. And believe me, I wish we could press a, a lot more albums, but it's just the reality is, is they're not all available. Um, for a number of different reasons, or the artist just is past it and they don't want anything to do with it, which I get to. It's been a long time. And so it takes, it takes cooperation from the artist, not only cooperation, it takes passion from the artist too. If the artist doesn't have any interest in this, it's not going to work because you're going to need their support. You got to have their support to promote it, whether it's from a pre-existing kind of band page or environment or community, or just the band members themselves personally getting behind it. Because again, none of these releases that we're pressing, we're not pressing up thousands of records. We're doing short runs of one, two, 300 records. In, in one case, the Flicker Stick record, we did 600. That was the biggest pressing we've done. But all these others, we purposefully kept them limited because we don't want to overpress them. But it also keeps it, um, you know, it keeps the demand there because if there's only 100 a record or 200 a record, that's a lot more special for a fan to get their hands on one than if we would press a thousand of these and be sitting on them for years, you know? So for us, it's about, I would say it's about quality versus quantity, not only in the number of pressing, but also in the number of releases we put out and the number of, um, and just the amount of, of work involved. We, we would rather focus on stuff that is really quality, great, great music, um, great artists that uh, have passion and who, who are interested in the format and are interested in kind of keeping that legacy alive. So hence the name, the DFW Legacy Series. So that's kind of the story. Um, if you've made it this far, you're probably interested in some of this. We'll put the links to the DFW Legacy Series where you can get them, where you can um, see uh, the catalog and obviously um, a link to the Facebook group if you're really interested in joining, if you're from this uh, if you have history like we do from this era of this scene from the 90s to the 2000s. So uh, really appreciate you watching. Hopefully this was helpful and educational for anyone who kind of wonders how this stuff works. Again, ours is a unique scenario, but I think there's probably some parallels that people can draw if they're thinking about doing this or, or just curious how it would work to do something like this. So uh, that's the story of the DFW Legacy Series. Really appreciate you watching. We'll see you again next time on Talking About Records.